So last week, uh, we looked at the, the first, what was it, the first 15 verses of uh, first, or Second Peter chapter 1. Uh, if you were here, I, I left out a whole bunch. And so today, uh, we're going to finish the chapter, but the, we're going to also go back and look at some of the stuff that um, I kind of left some meat on the bone, so to speak. We're going to go back and, and look at that, specifically verses 5 through 9. Uh, but let's go ahead and read our text. So we're picking up uh, at verse 16 of 2 Peter 1. Peter writes, we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Peter is giving us, in in this last bit of, of chapter 1, he's giving us reasons why we ought to pay attention to God's Word. He says there in verse 19, you do well. You do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Last week, we looked at the encouragement for the church to, uh, to gain what he calls true or to pursue what he calls true knowledge. Of course, we know all of this comes from his word, but we, we saw how that knowledge that he's talking about is, is knowledge that must be experienced. It's not just book knowledge. It's not secret knowledge, right? The whole idea of secret knowledge, that, that has to do with the, the false teachers. But it's true knowledge gained by the application of God's word in our lives, now, in verses 5 through 9, Peter gives the church instructions uh, in, in the kind of moral righteousness, the kind of moral behavior that we ought to be engaged in. And, and his point is that when it's practiced, it gives us a richer experience, it gives us a richer understanding gives us that true knowledge that he's talking about. It, it needs to be practiced. It can't just be read. It can't even just be read and memorized. Even though that's all good. If you want to internalize it and, and, and grow, it's got to be experienced. Now, to be clear, before we look at it, to be clear in regard to our, our salvation, and, and we have to keep in mind, he's writing to the church. He's writing to believers. In regard to our salvation, salvation is entirely a work of God. Amen? God is the one who saves us. We saw in verse 3, He's the one who called us. It is He who has given us grace and peace that we saw in verse 2. It's God and God alone who, uh, as it says in verse 3, by His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. It's he, in verse 4, who's given us his precious and magnificent promises. We, we've got to keep that. Anytime you're talking about, okay, here's a list of things we got to do, you always have to stop and go, okay, this isn't in regard to salvation. Salvation is a work of God. We trust in Jesus Christ. We receive the forgiveness of sins. It's all what he's done. We're just recipients of the free gift. Amen? However, 
again, there is responsibility for the Christian. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. The gospel, once received, compels us to grow in grace, to grow in the knowledge of God. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, the Apostle Paul says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And that's, that's exactly the point, that we need to, as we're looking at this list of things that we need to do, that we're obligated to do, it's the working out of our salvation, initiated by God, but then we have a part in the working out, the, the process of sanctification. William Barclay in his commentary said this. He says, it is true that everything is of faith, but a faith which does not issue in life is not faith at all. As Paul would heartily have agreed, faith is not only commitment to the promises of Christ, it is also commitment to his demands. To know the promises of God, which Peter has talked about, to know the promises of God is one thing, to experience them, experience them is quite another. And you will never experience them so long as you are slack in obeying him. So last week we, we read these instructions in verses 5 through 9. Today I want to revisit them because we didn't really expound on them at all. These are the things that Peter is, is telling the church. These are things you should apply yourself to do. He says, verse 5, For this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, Supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Notice the progression. Like when we read those, do you notice that there is a, a progressive nature laid out? One is seemingly, it's like one is folded into another. They're like rungs on a ladder ascending to the highest virtue. All within the scope of practicing our faith. Again, not too long ago, we were in the book of James. And James, his primary lesson is you can't have a faith that's static. You can't have, oh, I believe in God, but never apply the things that he says. Faith works. A faith that does not work is useless. This is what Peter is telling us. And so, and so here, within the scope of our faith, um, and, and it needs to be said, he says we're, we're, we're to apply all diligence Right? We're, we're to, uh, this is something that we should work at. Um, but it's not so much our striving as it is our yielding. These are the things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. Right? God wants us to grow. He wants us to grow in righteousness in the process of sanctification. And for us, it's, it's more a partnership in growing. But it does take determination. It does take some effort. In your faith, supply moral excellence. This is intimidating. Just right off the bat, it's intimidating, isn't it? Who's, who's morally excellent? Well, we ought to work at that. What does it mean to be morally excellent? Well, here's the first thing. I think the most important thing, if you want to be morally excellent, you must understand that God determines what's morally excellent. You don't. The culture doesn't. The culture is trying to tell us what's moral and what's immoral. God, in his word, he has determined what is moral, what is immoral. And so all this means is to be yielded to him. What does the word of God say? What does the word of God say is moral or immoral? 
We must be guided by that. If you want to be morally excellent, then just simply be yielded to what the scripture says. Whether you like it or not, he didn't ask me. He didn't ask you, right? He hasn't sought the wisdom of man in determining these things. He's the, the, the author of creation. He's the designer of us all. He knows what is right. He knows what is wrong. We cannot assume our own morality. Again, nor can we adopt the morality that the culture is peddling. God is the judge. So to be morally excellent, we need to determine to live lives that are in agreement with his word. Within that. So again, this is one is kind of folded into another. In your moral excellent knowledge. Now this word knowledge is gnosis. And it simply means practical wisdom. We need to have practical wisdom. And, and, and again, these kind of go together. Uh, without practical wisdom, moral excellence can become legalism. We need to have wisdom. Jesus, he, he demonstrated this in the Gospels. Of course, you, you guys probably know this story. It's a great story that demonstrates this idea of how practical wisdom, the, the, the knowledge of God, it fits in with morality, even excellent morality. There was a legal dispute, you may recall, uh, over the, the, the Sabbath, the day of rest. And, and the Pharisees, who are the, as a type, they're the legalists, they're the nitpickers, the religious guys. They caught the disciples, the followers of Christ. They were walking through the, the, the grain fields and picking some of the wheat and eating it. And they were, they were accusing them, these guys have broken the Sabbath. Your followers are breaking the Sabbath because they're harvesting. Which obviously, it's laughable. It's laughable. Technically, technically they were right. And, and they sought to be more, not just morally excellent, but morally superior. But without knowledge, without understanding, that just became legalism. And so they had to have a talk with Jesus. And, and he gives us this great wisdom. He says, he says the, the Sabbath wasn't, or man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. The whole point of the Sabbath is, is that it's, it's, it's a benefit to, to mankind. It's a blessing to mankind. It is a law that God gave for us. And he basically just said, you know, relax. These guys are not breaking the Sabbath. They're not breaking the intention of the Sabbath. Their knowledge, wisdom from God, it, it, it helped to understand what might otherwise just be legalism. The purpose of the law, there was a higher law actually to it. We should constantly... This idea of, of in our moral excellence being pursuing knowledge, we should constantly be pursuing the knowledge of God. Like just the practical knowledge of God. Daily Bible reading is the best way, right? Is the best way to read the scriptures. You're, if you want to know about God, it's right here. Again, he said everything you need to know. It's right here. Uh, so daily Bible reading is the best way to prepare yourself, your brain, every day to receive knowledge from God. Now, we talked a little bit about this last week. Um, uh, uh, God's going to give you wisdom. He's going to give you practical wisdom. Uh, it's never going to contradict what this says. If you feel like God's giving you something that's contradicting what this says, it's probably just bad pizza or something. You know, it's just not, do you know what I'm saying? You have to be very careful. But, but this is where knowledge comes from. And so I would just say, if you don't have a habit of daily Bible reading, you should have a, a habit of daily Bible reading. Pursue this, pursue knowledge. In Proverbs 9.10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Everything that we need to know about life comes from God. And, and you know, one of the things that I, 
I, I think is just absolutely true that you and I ought to, to believe in and hold on to is that even in the practical matters of life that have nothing to do seemingly with spiritual things, God can give wisdom to you. Like the things that you don't know how to do when you're seeking the Lord, he knows, right? He knows. And, and he gives he gives great wisdom, advancements in science and in all the things that we have over the eons learned to do. It's from God. Knowledge comes from God. We need to apply ourselves to that. The third thing he lists out here is in your knowledge, self-control. Oh, self-control. Self-control is, is based in knowledge, knowledge of God, knowledge of his word, Peter is going to speak harshly in uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3. He's going to take on the, the Gnostics, the, the false teachers. Part of their MO is no self-control. I mean, that's just the worldly MO, right? That is the worldly wisdom is just do whatever you want. You know, as they used to say, you know, if it feels good, do it, right? That's the, that's the world. And we have all kinds of problems because of that. Uh, so the, the false teachers that he's going to take on, they have no self-control. When man is ignorant of God's word, as we once were, what did you do? When you were ignorant of God's word, what did you do? You did whatever you wanted. I remember that. And then, and then the word of God comes to us, and all of a sudden our conscience is alive. Oh, uh-oh, that thing that I've been doing, that... That thing now I regret because now the word of God has shown me the wisdom, the knowledge of God has shown me that thing is sin. It's actually not good. It's actually harmful. We cannot, the Christian must not, cannot be led by our flesh to, to do whatever the fleshly impulses we have are. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, Paul takes this on a little bit. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That word sanctification is holiness, set apart. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passions like the Gentiles who do not know God. There is just one example. You can't, Christian, you can't do that anymore. The thing that you used to do, whatever my flesh wants to do, no, you can't do that. The whole idea is, is you need to learn how to, I like the language, learn how to possess your vessel. Self-control. When we have knowledge, when we know what God says, we have an obligation as Christian men and women to yield to that knowledge. That's why so many people don't want to hear it. Right? I don't, I don't, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Because they think, if I don't hear it, then I'm not obligated. The problem is, God has already stated these things. And, and we know. We need to yield. And we don't do that on our own. We do, we yield in cooperation with the Holy Spirit directed by God's word. We are not animals. We are not animals. Animals have no self-control. I know this is kind of graphic, but it's a, it's a good picture. You know, your dog will do whatever in your front yard, in front of everyone. We're not supposed to be like that. We are not like that. God's given us of his Holy Spirit. He's enabled us to say no. That thing, according to the word of God, according to the knowledge that I have, because of the word of God, I know that that thing is improper for a Christian to be involved in, and whatever it is, therefore, I'm going to yield to it. I'm going to say no. I'm going to have some self-control. Now, the fourth thing, again, these are all kind of folding into one another. He says, in your self-control, perseverance. I would just say right off the bat, why perseverance? 
Because even in your self-control, you're going to fail. Because you're, you're a sinner. Perseverance is a patience enduring. It means to remain under trials and testing in a way that honors God. Our process of sanctification, that is, our, our, our process of growth, is just that. It's a process. And because of sin, because of the sin nature that's within us, we have setbacks. You have setbacks. You fall down, go boom. Every one of us, it happens. The trick is to get back up. The trick is to receive grace and, and, and keep going. And this is where... This is where so many in our culture, they don't get it. Get back up. Get going. Sometimes the setbacks we have are our own doing. Sometimes they're others. Hurt us, harm us. But we must be a people who persevere. By the strength that God supplies, we get back up and we keep going by God's grace. We persevere day by day. One day at a time, they say. Sometimes it's by the hour. We persevere. Daily we sin. Daily we're washed. Jesus' blood provides perpetual cleansing for the child of God. We need to persevere. Hang on. I think this, this is one that I think is so important. He says, in your perseverance, the fifth thing here, godliness. Again, it's like we're climbing a ladder of virtues here. We're persevering. We're persevering. And every once in a while, there's going to be some godliness. I know. It's like, whoa, all right. What is this? Godliness means we begin at some point to actually look a little bit like Jesus. Hopefully, hopefully that's every day, right? As a result of applying diligence and all these other virtues, we begin at some point to, to have a glimmer of Christ in our lives in regard to what other people see. By God's power and the, the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, through the word of God, we persevere, not shrinking back. We begin to reflect the Lord and more and more. Of course, right away, the danger is that we can begin, we, you, you know, oh, oh, I had a good day. Uh, you know, maybe I, I witnessed or I did something that was positive and other people saw it. And then the temptation is, look at me, you know. No, you didn't do that. You're in partnership with God who's doing it. But the whole idea is, is, this, is this is kind of the goal. We want to reflect the Lord. Do you want to look like Jesus? I want my life to reflect Him. All these things are, are, are necessary in order to get to this place where, where we may look a little bit like Him. Even what effort we contribute, it's all by his grace and power that works within us. Paul gives us a, a, a note of hopefulness here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. He says, now to him who is able to do, it's important, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we, we ask or think according to the power that works within us. We'll be able to look a little bit like Jesus. And this is what people need. People don't need to see me. They don't need to see you. People need to see Jesus in you. It's the most attractive thing any one of us will ever see. Jesus Christ. The sixth th item here is, in your godliness, brotherly kindness. Now we're getting somewhere. The, the, the word there is one of the, the words that we have for love. It's Philadelphia. It's a brotherly love. We're getting near the, the top rung uh, of the ladder. 
when you get to the point when you're about loving others, you're looking like Jesus. This is, the goal. This is his goal for the church. It's, it's, it's what we just heard from our team. You know, I got to know. I got, we got to know one another. There, of course, the three of the four members are family members, so they already know, know each other. But, but when we work together and when we're working in cooperation with the Lord, we get to know each other and also our lives our lives begin to be more about other people and less about us. That's why, it's why I think every Christian, if you're able, should, you should go on a mission trip. You should go somewhere, set aside time, set aside the money that it takes, set aside the resources and the time in your schedule to go and just purely serve other people. You'll grow. You'll be blessed. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Jesus came to serve. He came to serve others. It's a great virtue when your life begins to take this, sh- this kind of shape where, where you, you just have it within you to love, to love the brethren. And finally, the seventh thing that he, he gives us In your brotherly kindness, love. Love, the greatest of all virtues. Paul wrote, you know, a whole chapter on this in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I have nothing. It's so, it's so beautiful. It's so important to remember that. This is the, this is the pinnacle of, of Jesus at work in our lives. This isn't brotherly love. This is beyond brotherly love. He goes on, he goes on to say, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest virtue that we can have is agape. This is a, a selfless love. It's a sacrificial love. It's not Philadelphia. It's greater than brotherly love. It's not eros, which is another Greek word for love, uh, a romantic or even sexual love. That's fleeting, and it's based on the flesh. It's not storge, which is a familial love. You know, the love of parent and child or brother and sister. It's It's deeper than that. It's the love of God demonstrated in Christ's Sacrificial love. In Philippians 2, 3, Paul says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Let me know when you get there. When you get to that point, you can write a book. But that's our goal. And so these are, these are Peter's instructions. This is the gospel. It's like the gospel expanded translation. Here's how the gospel is supposed to work out in your lives. Apply yourselves. Be diligent in in working on each one of these things. Now, the reason why I wanted to go back and kind of slow roll those virtues that we should be diligently supplying in our lives is become we come now to the reason why we should be paying attention to and heeding these instructions. He's going to give us this argument. He, he's already said, uh, I'm going to remind you of these things. Look at verse 12. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. Like if you've been, if you've been a Christian any length of time, anything that we just read, it's not new information. They're just reminders. So Peter's saying, I'm just reminding you of these things. You already know them. And you've been established in the truth which is present in you. So he's saying, he's saying, I, I'm not teaching you these things for the first time. I'm reminding you of them. I, 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 he wants the church to know the word of God. But more than knowing what it says in a technical sense, he wants us to know by experience. You must apply these things in your life. It's the application of the word 
that takes us into a deeper understanding that gives us what we call, what he's referred to as a true knowledge. And all of this, all of this is in light of the fact, kind of a broader sense of what he's talking about here in this letter. It's all in light of the fact that there's false teachers who are teaching something different. He does not want the church to be led astray. That's why he wants to remind us of the word. As he says in verse 10, as long as you, look at that, verse 10, as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. The idea of stumbling there isn't tripping. It, the idea is lapsing back into sin, kind of on a permanent nature to be debased. He says, as long as you are practicing these things, you will not stumble, and that's his whole point. That's the heart. That's the heart of the apostle. That's the heart of a pastor. That's the heart of the Lord. He doesn't want his kids stumbling. So here's his argument. There's four things here in the, the last part, verses 16 through 21, that we're going to look at. First of all, he says, we didn't make this up. We, we, didn't, we didn't make it up. Look at what he says. We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of the, this is one of the main arguments of people who really don't know the word of God who are skeptics of the Word of God and of Christianity in general. They're, oh, well, that, that book that you read, that book that you hold on to you that you think is so important, it's just a bunch of made-up stories. It's a bunch of fables. That's an ignorant person who says that. It's someone who hasn't read it. If they have read it, they've maybe given it a surface read, even to the point where their eyes are not open to understand it. This isn't just a history book. It's something much more than that. He says, we didn't, we didn't make this up. He's referencing, now, now look again at verse 16. We didn't follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, this is what he's going to tackle when we get to chapter 2 and 3. He's going to tackle this whole idea of the future revelation of Jesus Christ in power. That's, the, that's kind of his main point, although he's, he's talking about all the word of God as the apostles are delivering it. But specifically, one of the things that the false teachers are always criticizing is this hope that we have of the future return of Jesus. He says, he says I've told you about that, and I'm reminding you of that. We didn't make it up. This is the theme that he's going to revisit over and over. We saw it in 1 Peter as he's trying to encourage the church in the midst of their persecutions. What did he, he kept reminding them that the Lord's coming. The Lord's coming. This is the great hope that we have. It's not a made-up thing. He, he's going to emphasize in chapter 3 the coming day of the Lord. There's so many arguments for anyone who's studied the Bible. There's so many arguments for why Scripture, why we understand that Scripture is not made up. But there's just this general, uh, general argument or apologetic, if you will. It's just for the harmony of the Scriptures. There's no, there's no other work like this. 66 different books writ written by a, a, a whole slew of different authors over thousands of years, in different geographical locations and settings and cultures, with one theme, with one message, the redemption of man by God through faith. And, and, and it's harmonious. Although we have different styles of writing, you know, we've got wisdom, we've got prophecy, We've got narrative. We've got all these different things. And yet, there's one message. God redeems man in the, in the person of Christ. That alone is miraculous when you understand it. His language, even, even throughout these verses 16 through 18, he even speaks to the harmony of the apostles. Notice that he says we over and over and over again. 
He's not talking just about him. He's not saying, hey, I'm Peter. By the way, remember, Jesus made me the Pope, which is a false teaching. Right? He's not saying, I, I, I'm Peter. I was there, so I'm the one. That... No, he's saying we. We, over and over. We did not follow cleverly devised tales. We were eyewitnesses. We ourselves heard. We were with him. The word of God is not like the made-up tales in the false religion. That's his point. It's, it's, it's the same point today. There are those false religions just completely made up of whole cloth. He says, we're not like that. And he goes on, building his case here. We're eyewitnesses. I was there. Look at what he says. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him, or made yeah, to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Notice again, similarly to the, the points we looked at earlier, one point seems to stem from the second. He's building a case. It's not made up. Here's how I know it's not made up. I was there. I'm an eyewitness. H how do we know? How do we know that we didn't follow cleverly devised tales? Because I was there. Peter, James, and John, this is what he's referencing. Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on what's known as the Mount of Transfiguration. Turn to Luke chapter 9. This is what he's referencing, so it's good for us to look at it. Luke 9, 28 through 36. It says, Jesus took along Peter, James, or Peter, John, and James, and, and he went up on the mountain to pray. Luke 9, 28 through 36. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. Matthew adds a little something else in, in his retelling of this. It says, his, faith, his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. It's, it's not like he just had bleached clothing on. Right? Don't get the impression that it was just bleached. No, there was light emanating from his body. This is cool. This is like, this is like sci-fi cool. Luke goes on, and behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem, now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep. <laughs> there we go. There's the knuckleheads. But when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as these were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Not realizing what he was saying, while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and they reported to no one in those days any of these things which they had seen. This is, this is incredible. This is Peter's testimony. I was there. You know what I love about this story? And it's a great, it's a great apologetic for the entire story, for the veracity of the story. It includes Peter being stupid. Well, he wouldn't, he, well, this is not one of the stories you would want to reference. Like if you were making this thing up, you wouldn't want to include that. 
Like you'd probably lobby your friends, hey, that thing when I was walking on water, don't, let's not include that either. Because Peter did some goofy things. Here, here he is as he's taking all of this in. He, it says, not realizing what he was saying. Hey, Lord, this is incredible. Let's build tabernacles for the three of you. No, Peter, that's stupid. In fact, in fact, it says, not realizing while he was saying it, then God interrupts him. It's like, great idea, Peter. Shut up. I got something I want to say. I mean, literally, literally, it says, while he was saying this. God interrupts him with what he has to say, which is the point of this whole thing. This is my son. They heard a voice out of the cloud, God the Father speaking. God interrupted him. And so, obviously, we don't know about all this story. I know there's a lot of speculation that somehow this was a, like a, a, a leadership meeting of some sort. I, I don't know. It says that they were talking about the, what Jesus was about to do. It's beautiful. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a story that gives us great hope. It's the hope of eternal life. Here's, here's two guys, Moses and Elijah, very much alive and glorified. Changed, not they're human in form, but different. That, gives, that, gives, that should give all of us hope. This is what Peter wants us to have in mind. He also sees in the story the power of God. Not just, again, not just alive, but transformed, glorified. The unique identity of Jesus. Moses and Elijah, great, but Jesus is the one. God says, this is my son. This is the one I want you to listen to. He's not like, he's not like the prophets. He's not like any of these other guys. Great as they were used by God, Jesus is unique. And to hear the voice of God. It's interesting that as you look at the description of this whole thing, Peter seemed to be more impacted by what he heard than what he saw. That's his testimony. His testimony is about what he heard. Yeah, we saw it. It was cool. But I heard the voice of God. The reason why Peter used this event in his letter in 2 Peter that we're reading now, is again, it's because he's, he's refuting, he's going to refute the false teaching. And the false teaching, if you, go, if you look forward to chapter 3 specifically, it, it, the false teaching is about the idea that God really isn't, Jesus isn't really coming. That's part of their false teaching. There's a lot of teachers today that neglect that. Oh, we don't, I don't really understand that. And so we're, we're not going to talk about it. Friends, this is the blessed hope. It's all through his first letter. It's all through the second letter. It's all through Paul's writings. We have a great hope. It's not just that Jesus came for salvation. It's that he's going to come as a righteous judge. That is the hope that we have. That's the hope that this story points out. Now he points out an even greater foundation for trusting in the word of God. It builds upon, back in our text, it builds upon and adds to the prophetic word. Look at what he says in verse 19. We have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. And here's his point. Again, as he's writing to the church, they have at this point, they have an understanding of the gospel, but it's all being kind of, it's in process, right? Through these letters and through the revelation of God to the apostles. It's, it's in essence being written, but the New Testament the gospel itself is built on the foundation of the Old Testament. And people say, oh, the Old Testament is not important. It's totally important because it lays the foundation. It lays the groundwork. Specifically here, he's referencing the word of the prophets. 
the prophet spoke of the Messiah who was to come. Anyone who's honestly and thoughtfully studied the Old Testament prophets, you know, you'll see there's, there's hundreds of prophecies in history and specifically in the, about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And he, he himself made this really clear. Look at what he said in John 5, 46. Jesus said, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. There in the law, he says, he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Again, what is he talking about? He's saying, there's a foundation. There's a foundation for what I'm doing, what I'm saying. It comes from of old. Jesus actually began his ministry preaching from the prophets. You guys know that, right? He, he went into the synagogue and he read from the prophets. Luke 4, 17 through 21. It says, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So I, that just gives me chills. This, the, the prophecy of Isaiah was written 700, 750 years before Jesus was born. And yet he boldly declares, not only did Moses know about me and write about me, here, here's this prophecy from Isaiah, which all the people would know from Isaiah 61. He's reading from that. He says, this is about me. And in your hearing, it's fulfilled. I'm here and I'm about to do these things. I'm about to release the captives. The idea there is those who are captive to sin, captive to the devil. In Christ, you can be released. He's proclaiming the gospel. And so Peter says, listen, you do well. Friends, you do well to pay attention to this like a, like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. The word of God is like a lamp. The, the word of God directs us. It says in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We need it. And again, there in the last, last part of, of verse 19, it pour, point, uh, points towards the future. It points towards this very thing that's, that's you know, being rejected by the false teachers. He says, uh, the day that will dawn that, that dawning that he's talking about is the return of Christ. It could mean just the general revelation of Jesus dawning in their heart, but since it's written to believers and he's exhorting the reader to, to wait until some future event, that's not what it's about. It's another example of him wanting us to keep in mind what's to come. Jesus Christ is coming back. Now, his final argument for why we should be paying attention to Scripture and growing in the true knowledge of God is, is simply this. It's from God. Know this. First of all, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Again, he's addressing these false teachers, these Gnostics. They had their own take. Be careful of someone who has their own take on Scripture, their own private interpretation. No, you can't have a private interpretation. There is no private interpretation. When you begin to rely on personal or private revelations, you get off track really quickly. He says, these individuals were, were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
At times, God spoke directly. God spoke directly to Moses. Peter heard God speak directly. But that doesn't discount what God has revealed through the prophets, through the apostles. He has spoken through them by his divine power. This is the case for what we do, right? This is the case for what we do. We're paying attention to the word of God. We're reading, we're applying ourselves to the word of God. The world is not in need of a philosophy, but a revelation of God. We need the truth of God's word. Not just intellectually, right? As Christians, we cannot simply be students. We must be disciples. We must hear the word of God and apply the word of God in our lives. We must obey the word of God. And this is what he says. This is the promise. As long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. And that's his point. He doesn't want the church to stumble into the things which are false. Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for these instructions that cover every area of our lives. God, we're thankful for the hope that the word of God gives us. I pray that we would put these things to practice in our lives, but also just the, the idea of the hope of what's to come. May we hold on to the blessed hope of the return of Christ. Over and over and over again, your word tells us of this event. Certainly today, Lord, where it seems like the day is dark and filled with confusion. May we hold on for dear life to the hope of your return. Thank you, God, for the eternal life that you have promised us, who trust in you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 